Hey guys, I'm Papa Pete and welcome to today's episode of The 125. The 125 is my YouTube show that highlights the 125 games that were released for the original television system back between 1979 and 1989. I do it a little bit differently in the fact that I have two different videos for each episode. This one here is the review and the history uh, where I talk about the gameplay and the history behind the game and basically how you play. But I also have an actual gameplay uh, episode that it shows a little bit of the gameplay from each of the games that I've highlighted in the history review episode. Anyway, guys, without further ado, today's game is another a magic title, and it is, as you can see right here, Safe Cracker. Very interesting game. I can't wait to take a look at it, so stick around. Here we go. If you're looking for that special item for your Intellivision collection, be sure to check out IntellivisionCollector.com, the official sponsor of the 125. Once again, for all your Intellivision collecting needs, that's IntellivisionCollector.com. During the second half of 1982, game design intern Marvin Mednick created a very interesting game for the Intellivision called Safecracker. With veteran sound designer Dave Durant doing the sound for Safecracker, it ended up being the sole game credit for Mednick on the uh, television for Magic. Safecracker was actually released in June 1983, putting it in the middle wave of a Magic titles that released for the Intellivision, so it isn't as common as the early releases that you'll see like Demon Attack, Beauty and the Beast, Atlantis, but it isn't quite as rare and as difficult to find as the very late releases like Fathom and Truckin'. One thing about Safecracker is upon its initial release, it certainly did turn some heads not only with its very interesting premise, but with its amazingly beautiful graphics and its isometric point of view. This one player only game puts the player in the role of an international spy who's tasked with driving throughout the city searching for specific embassies that host safes containing sensitive stolen documents, top secret equipment, and other clues for unlocking the safe that contains the biggest treasure of them all, the gold bullion the stash in the city's treasury. The more gold and treasures that you can steal, the bigger the score. So let's take a look at the gameplay. In Safecracker, you start each game with five chances, or lives if you were. And you can lose these lives or chances by running your car into curbs, uh, crashing into buildings, uh, crashing into innocent bystander cars, or being shot or run into by the secret police who are constantly on your tail trying to catch you and put you in this slammer. Each round of gameplay, or raid as it's called in the manual, starts with your vehicle parked outside your secret hideout. Now, as for it actually being a secret hideout, uh, frankly, it's right in the middle of the city and it's a black building with a red roof that's really easy to pick out, but we'll talk, We'll worry about that later for the point in the game. I guess nobody else can see that but you. The object of the game is to drive from your hideout to one of the embassies in the game and break in, crack open the safe that contains either keys, cameras, microfilm, or chemicals, steal those items, get back out, and return them to your secret hideout for points and extra bonuses. The whole time you're trying to successfully navigate your way around the city, avoiding the secret police as they're trying to put a stop to you. And one other thing you get, if you do successfully crack open a safe in one of the embassies, you get one of the digits toward the combination of the biggest prize of them all, and that is the safe with the gold bullion that's located in the city's treasury. So let's talk about driving to the embassy, which is one of two very distinct stages that are in the Safecracker gameplay. Uh, first of all, when you go out onto the map screen, you as a spy are the blue car, which is always at the center of the screen. You accelerate and decelerate by pushing up and down on the game desk. Uh, and pushing left and right on the game desk doesn't really make you turn around quarters, well, it doesn't at all. It all actually just makes you swerve left or right within the lane that you're driving on. In order to change the direction that your car is headed, you actually have to hold down on the lower left hand side button while you hit the game disc. So if you're holding down on that lower left hand side button and you tap to the right, you'll do a 90 degree turn to the right. Tap to the left, you'll do a 90 degree turn to the left. And even if you hit uh, down when you're holding that turn button, you'll do a 180 degree turn, basically a U-turn right in the middle of the street. And, and you flip right around, it doesn't loop around, it just immediately turns and starts going in the opposite direction. 
It's kind of interesting. You can't actually turn your vehicle 90 degrees left or right while you're not moving, but you can be sitting still and still do a U-turn. So as you can tell, the driving mechanism in SafeCracker is really unique. And I'll be quite frank here and tell you, it takes a long time to master control of your car in SafeCracker. Uh, I'm going to be quite honest as well the fact that I don't know that I've ever really mastered it, to be quite honest. It is so easy. You have to learn to make those turns at just the right moments because it's so easy to be off a little bit and crash into the curbs, crash into the buildings and lose a life. It's just, it's very, very difficult. To, to really start feeling comfortable with the with the driver. As far as obstacles on the roads go, first of all, there are white cars driving around, which are just frankly innocent bystanders, citizens of the city driving around, and you have to do all you can do to avoid those people. If you run into them or they run into you, you lose a life. <laughs> Big explosion. Finally, there's also the black cars driving around the city, which are the secret police. They can not only run into you to kill you, but they can shoot you as well. Uh, but you can also shoot back. You shoot by using the right hand side buttons, you shoot forward by hitting the top one, and you shoot backwards by hitting the bottom one. Now you cannot shoot at 90 degrees from your car. Uh, there's no penalty whatsoever for shooting the secret police cars, but there's definitely a penalty if you shoot one of the innocent bystander white cars. You lose 200 points, but not only that, the sirens will go off and the secret police will come at you fast and furious if you start taking out the, the general public. Anytime you crash your car into another car or one of the obstacles, or you're shot by the police, you lose one of your five chances. Naturally, citizen traffic levels and secret police aggressiveness and basic quantity of how many there are around both increase with the difficulty that you pick. You pick your difficulty right from the keypad to the title screen. It's right there on the overlay. Easy, medium, and hard. So now for the big question. When you leave your secret hideout, how do you know where to go to find the embassy in which you have to break in and open the safe? Well, frankly, the navigation in Safecracker is pretty ingenious. You'll notice that with the isometric point of view, your car is always pointing in one of four diagonal directions. If you take note of your overlay, it has a border with four different colors. Going around clockwise from the upper right, it's yellow, green, blue, and red. Now while you're driving and searching for the embassy on the map, the screen border will change to match one of the directions in those corners, and that is the direction you should be going. Like I said, it's really ingenious. So you go in the direction that's indicated on your screen border and you watch for the building with diamond shaped markings on it and there you go, there's your embassy. Simply pull up beside it, park right outside and exit and you can go into the building to try to crack open the safe. Overall, the safe cracking part of the game is really very simple. When you enter the embassy, you go into a room with nothing but a window and the safe visible. At the bottom of the screen, it says how many numbers are left in the combination to open the safe. And it also gives you the time limit of how many seconds you have left to do it. And it usually starts with 30 seconds. Now the safe shows a combination number from 0 to 99 right on the front of it. And what you do is you have two options for scrolling through those numbers. You have a fast scroll, which is using either top side button, or a slow scroll, which is using either bottom side button. And as you go by the next number in line, the number flashes red and it makes a beep. Now when you're going really fast, it's, it's very fast. But when you're going slow, it's slow enough that if you only use a slow, you'd never be able to get the numbers in time. So the object of the game is to try to scroll as fast as possible past them all. And then as you go by one, hear the beep, you get back around to that point and then go slow till you have the actual number. When you have the red number right there on the screen, you can hit enter and that picks your first number or last number or whatever number it is that you need for opening the safe. Depending on the difficulty, it could take between one and five red numbers to open the safe. If you successfully pick the lock of the safe, you get 500 bonus points. Plus, you get the item that it shows, which you can return to your hideout for even more points. Plus again, if you've successfully picked the lock, you get one of the numbers in the combination for the treasury safe that lets you get the big load of gold bullion from the treasury at the end of the round. If you unsuccessfully open the safe, you run out of time, you're booted back out into the street, you have to drive back to your hideout to start the next raid. If you are running out of time, there's one other option that lets you open the safe without properly picking the combination, and that is you can blow it open with TNT. And there's a few drawbacks to that. The, first of all, the good thing about that is you do get the item that was in it to return 
to the hideout to, to get the points, but you lose the 500 bonus points. You don't get a number for the combination for the treasury vault, and also it makes the secret police be hot on your tail as soon as you leave that embassy. It's a tough decision to have to blow the safe like that, but it is an option. Now once you've successfully picked the locks on four safes, you're in four, basically have four successful raids. You'll have enough numbers to crack the combination, open up the vault in the treasury to get all that gold bullion. Now it's kind of interesting because the navigation system doesn't work the same. Uh, there's no colors to border when you're going for the treasury. It's purple. But it's really not that big of a deal and sort of strange why they decided to do this. I really don't know the story behind that. But because the treasury is always in the exact same spot. It's really easy to spot because it has dollar signs on it. It's to the southwest of the hideout. Uh, again, doesn't matter how many rounds you play, it's always in the same spot. Uh, when you go into the vault in the treasury, you have to have memorized the, the combination. It's given to you on the information screen that you see while you're at your hideout. So make sure you know that number because there's no uh, beeping or red indication on the safe in the treasury to open it up and get the bullion. You just have to remember the numbers. Try them, hit enter, you'll see the number go down saying you only need one more. Once you open them, there's the gold bars. Get the gold bars back to the hideout. Another fringe benefit for getting that treasury safe open, getting the gold bullion out, which you get 500 points for doing so, and getting it back to your hideout, which you get an extra 1,000 points if you get the gold bullion back to your hideout safely, but it's the fact that you get a free chance, another life basically, every time you do successfully pick and open that treasury safe. That's basically the end of the round when that happens. So you do four raids, Go to the treasury, try to get the gold bullion, get it back to your hideout. Then you start all over again. The object, the combination's wiped out. You need four more embassy raids, uh, more items, uh, more numbers. Back to the treasury, get gold bullion again, get a free life again if you can, and you keep that going as long as possible. Because Safecracker, just like so many other games back in the 70s and 80s, ultimately, ultimately the object of the game was to score as many points as possible. The graphical innovations that Mendic introduced in Safecracker are where the game truly shines. The beautiful isometric point of view, which had been introduced in video games by titles like Zaxxon, uh, and other arcade titles like Qbert and Congo Bongo, had really be, been seen in original console games uh, up until that point. Safecracker was one of the very first to do so, and they did it very, very well. The colors in Safe Cracker are very bright and very vivid. Whether it's the buildings in the map screen, or it's the cars themselves, or even the borders that are used for help to, to help with the navigation, it's done quite well. The same holds true for the safe cracking screen, the screen with the safe. It uh, It's very clear, it's perhaps a bit too colorful, but it's very clear in being able to see what you need to see to properly pick that lock. Overall, I'm going to say that the graphics, especially with the isometric point of view, are very good in Safe Cracker. <laughs> Dave Duran and the other game designers make good use of sounds to accompany the gameplay in Safecracker. Uh, there's the purr of the engine when you're driving through the city. There's also uh, the little roar as you accelerate, pick up speed. Uh, even right down to the squawk of the tires as you uh, stop or as you turn the corner, turn those 90 degree corners. There's also a squawk of the tires when you rub up against the curbs, but you really want to watch out for that one because, frankly, one of the ways that I found I died most often is I got a little bit close, too close to the side to get the squawk when you rubbed up against the curb, and you could even blow up from just doing that. Speaking of blowing up, the gunfire in the game is crisp and clear, and if you run into another car, or if you get shot, or you shoot somebody else, the explosions are very standard, but well done overall in the game. Now, the safe cracker screen doesn't have much sound at all, but that kind of makes sense when you think about it, because every scene you ever see where somebody's trying to crack open a safe, they want silence as they're trying to listen to the lock. So the only sounds that are on the safe cracker screen, really, are the beeps as you go by the numbers. And it's just, it's a plain old beep. What more can be said about it? But it's kind of neat that that's the only sound on the screen. That is, at least until you blow it up with TNT. And then that makes a little bit more noise. <laughs> Another noise when you go back out onto the street. Very often when you go back onto the street, you're going to hear the wailing of the sirens from the secret police. 
especially after the TN, uh, you blow up a safe with TNT. And the wailing sirens are done quite well. Early games, uh, easy games and early levels, you won't hear the sirens because they aren't aut automatically chasing you down. Uh, it's all things that you do in the gameplay. Shooting uh, a bystander will do it. Blowing up a safe will do it. And then the secret police are really trying to hunt you down. And that's when you hear the sirens. They sound great, just the wailing, low-pitched uh, background noise. And a little different than sirens you hear most places. The last sound that I want to mention is the one that happens when you lose your final chance. The jail bars slam shut in front of you with the appropriate clink. Game over. Overall, I'm going to say I really enjoy the diverse sounds in Safecracker. I explained earlier on about both the lock picking and the driving controls. And if you remember correctly, I said that both can be very difficult to master. I'm going to stick to that statement because, frankly, a car is very difficult to control. It's very easy to slam into a curb by either turning into it directly or by skidding along the side of a curb until you explode. It's also very difficult to avoid the other cars on the road or avoid the secret police's bullets. Even the simple scrolling in the lock picking screen is very touchy. The fast scrolling almost seems like it's too fast, and the slow scrolling seems too slow. You only go in one direction, that's increasing in the numbers, so if you're going fast and you go by it, you have to wrap back around. And let me tell you, it's very easy to go by it again the second time. And if you pull up too short, the slow goes so slow, it just frustrates as you're trying to get up closer and closer to the proper number. Overall, I'm going to say it again, I find the general controls in Safecracker to be very frustrating. I can still remember when we got this game back in 1983. The premise seems rather simple now, but at the time it was simply amazing. Uh, you used to be able to drive around an entire city doing spy missions. I mean, back in those days, most games were on one stagnant screen. So to be able to do something like this, an, almost an open world, was simply amazing. This game is almost like a precursor for things like Grand Theft Auto and such, because it was the same premise. It was just the first one that introduced it back in the the era when these systems didn't have the ability to do these huge open worlds, but this was the first step into it. This is probably why I'm sort of excited to see what they can do with the Intellivision Amico version of State Cracker that's coming out. There hasn't been a whole lot released on it recently, but uh, hopefully we see it sometime in the near future, and the potential is pretty amazing for a game like this on that system. So getting back to a Magic's original Safecracker, it has beautiful graphics with this isometric point of view and crisp, clear colors. It also has good sounds. I really enjoy the diverse sounds. Are they amazing? No, they're not amazing sounds by any stretch of the imagination, but they do uh, are used effectively within the gameplay, and uh, overall I think they do a good job. The premise as well, very ambitious, and I can remember when leading up to this game's release, looking at the Magic catalogs coming soon, we really were looking forward to getting this game on the system back in 1982-1983. Unfortunately, there's still one major flaw with Safecracker, and as I've mentioned over and over again, that's the very difficult, sometimes if not often frustrating, controls that come with both stages of gameplay. I mean, when we finally got the game back in 1983, we played it, we enjoyed it, we had to play it, but then again, back in those days, you got games so infrequently, when you finally got it, you were going to play it no matter what. You are going to fight your way through it and learn how to play it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was the type of game that you'd put on, you'd play for a little while, and usually when you ended up turning it off, wasn't after completing a game, but it was when you uh, the frustration got too much and you almost rage quit. Given all of these pauses for the system... But that one big negative, I'm going to give a Magic Safecracker a 6 out of 10 rating. Well, guys, that's it for today's episode of The 125. Safecracker is one of those interesting games that always gets people's attention because there's not a high percentage of people who have played it, and there's not really a high percentage of people who are even all that familiar with it. But hopefully after my review here today, you'll give it a second look. Before I go, I want to give a special thank you to the official sponsor of the 125 and TelevisionCollector.com. Be sure, if you're looking for anything for your Intellivision collection, check out TelevisionCollector.com and Luke will be happy to help you find whatever you're looking for. Once again, thanks for spending a little bit of time with me today and we'll see you next time on the next episode of the 125. Take care. 
Papa P, Papa P, the old ass gamer. P, Papa P, the old ass gamer. If you haven't grown up by the age of 15, don't Hey, Brett Weiss here author of the 100 Greatest Console Video Games, 1977 through 1987, and many other books, and the host of Tales from a Retro Gamer. You have been watching Papa Pete, the old guy gamer. In fact, he's so old, he just might be older than me. Whoa.